Hey guys, something I wanted to do is just show you some of the things that we're uh, doing at the University of Miami and, and sharing with you some, uh, some different content. Uh, it, it, hopefully this helps you understand or uh, maybe gives you some more insights into some aspects of training. Uh, so here's a study that I'm going over right now in, in one of the courses, uh, and we're talking about sprint interval training. It's uh, changes in performance, muscle metabolites, enzymes, and fiber types after short sprint training. Uh, this is, you know, you can see the authors right here. Uh, Brian Dawson is the, uh, the lead author. Uh, it's from the European Journal of Applied Physiology in 1998. Now, uh, some of the studies that I like to present are old, and I show them uh, not because... Uh, you know, to, to not update things. I show them because, hey guys, there's a lot of great information that's out there. And just because something is new doesn't mean that it's anything better than things that are older. Uh, this study, obviously, with any studies, has got some flaws in it, but uh, let, let's go ahead and let's take a look. So the population they had were nine healthy and active, but they weren't athletes. They weren't well-trained. But they were healthy and active, so that means that hey, you know that they they're currently working out, they were exercising, but it's not like they were part of a team. Now here is the workout that they did. We can see that they did uh, six by eighty yard sprints. Uh, this might actually have been meters, uh, six by sixty, six by forty, four by forty, and they did a one to six work to rest ratio. Okay, and we can see that they did a total of twenty two repetitions. They would even they would rest uh, between two and four minutes between the sets. Okay, so one to six inter uh, intra set rest and uh, two to four minutes inter set rest, and then we can see how that progresses uh, as they go through. Now we can see that the intensity is ninety percent of their max velocity of the day, uh, and then we can see that we've got whenever there's an underline. <clears throat> that that's 100%. So now we know how fast they were running. We know the sets and the repetitions and the distance. Now, if we just look at this, we would expect, hey, you know, uh, if I'm doing 80 yards, 60 yards, 40 yards, 30 yards, that, hey, man, this is going to be an immediate energy system and glycolysis. But then we have to look over here for the work recovery duty cycle. Uh, now, with this, one to six, is this a complete or an in incomplete rest? Well, uh, if they are running for, let's say, 80 yards, let's give it, be generous and say that's uh, 11 seconds, right? So then that would be 11 seconds on, 66 seconds off. They are allowing uh, the half-life of phosphocreatine for that immediate energy system is 30 seconds. So they're definitely getting more than half. But it takes somewhere around four minutes for a complete restoration, I believe. It depends on the article that you look at. Uh, so they're not getting a complete recovery. So their fossil creatine stores are going to be dropping down each, each set. Uh, now, with that information, we can take out and we can look here and see, hey, pre and post, what happened with the metabolites and the, the enzymes? So if we look at ATP, we can see that there was a slight drop. But uh, if you look at the mean versus the standard deviation, there's an overlap, so there's no significant difference there for it or phosphocreatine. It could just be, you know, which individual cell that you got, right? Uh, well, then we look at the myokinase activity, and this is a, a glycolytic enzyme, right? And we, uh, we see that, hey, man, there's no significant change here, but we go down to the total phosphorylase. And out of the, all the phosphorylases, hey, we did see a, a significant increase in this anaerobic metabolism. Phosphofructokinase fructokinase, it went up, it wasn't significant, but then we see citrate synthase. Actually, uh, we saw a, a decrease in there, okay? Now, we look here and we see the uh, AMP kinase, also myokinase. This reaction is especially prevalent during high-speed work or heavy resistance training, and it's more common in type 2 fast twitch muscle fiber. So we know that, hey, we're going to expect to see that to, to increase. And did we? We did, but it wasn't significant. Now the PFK, right, phosphofructokinase, we can see this here. Uh, this is a from glycolysis, right? So these phosphorylase, here we go. Here's our uh, pho phosphofructokinase uh, uh, enzyme. So we know that, hey, we've got some action going on in glycolysis. And we see here 
uh, in the uh, aerobic energy system, this is the Krebs cycle, that, hey, citrate synthase, this is where it fits in. Now, that doubled up on me here. If we look here at the VO2 max, we see, hey, my VO2 max improved, and the P was less than 0 0.01. So yeah, I actually had a significant impact on my aerobic performance, but I didn't do any sprints over that uh, the 10 seconds, 11 seconds, 12 seconds. We know that for VO2 max to go up, you need to be up in the aerobic energy system, right? Well, why is that? Well, let, let's continue on for, for a minute here, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. So we see some of the uh, changes here. They did a 10 time and a 40 time. Now this was from a standing start. So at that 10, uh, it's not significantly different, but we can see that dropped a little bit. Now, the reason why it didn't reach significance, I would guess is from a two point start, they didn't, the, you aren't able to just start out with force. So you're having to rely on momentum and more sprint mechanics. Uh, so it's no surprise to me that at the 10 meter point, they didn't see any change, but they did at the 40. Now these decreases actually remember that a decrease in time means that you got faster. Typically, we think of increases as good, decreases as bad. Well, we have to have context that if this is a time, a decrease is good because they got faster. If this were velocity, a decrease would be bad because they got slower. Uh, one other thing that they did to kind of test anaerobic performance is that they had a super maximal run to exhaustion at 14 kilometers at, with a 20% grade. Now, 20% grade, this is, this is steep, right? This is... Uh, setting it all pretty much all the way up as high as that treadmill will go uh, on a specialized treadmill. And we can see that, hey, they were doing, uh, you know, it looks like about 50 seconds. They went up to about 58, and that was significant. They saw a significant improvement there. And then we look over at their 6 by 40 uh, meter sprints with 30 seconds of recovery, and I believe this is a total time for those six sprints. And we saw that, hey, we did have a small but significant uh, decrease here. Now we go back to the enzymes and we see that, hey man, our glycolysis got driven. We see some VO2 max improvements. Hey man, we're, we're seeing that we're getting a little bit of uh, all of the best uh, of all the world. Uh, and interestingly enough, even though there was a decrease in citrate synthase, so showing the aerobic uh, energy system, we had a decrease, but we still saw an increase in VO2 max and that could be a utilization of, uh, uh, of oxygen. Now with that, uh, activity. Here are some of the changes that we, they saw in the fibers. So we'll run through this. Our percentage of type one, so our number went from 45.8 to 36.2, and this is in six weeks. So this is pretty cool. Again, these aren't, uh, you know, elite level athletes. So we're going to see some bigger change in more, more rapid times, right? Uh, they, you see that most of them, uh, this was only out of seven of the nine people, there were some errors in the, in the biopsy techniques so that, that made the, the data on, yeah, the, those two people just got deleted, right? So they went from 45.8 to 36.2%. So they saw a decrease in type 1 fibers. And they went from 54.2 to 63.8 of the type 2. So we saw that we had an increase in the number of fibers. How many of the fibers went from type 1 to type 2? That actually increased. Now, if we look at the diameter of each individual fiber, and we see that the type 1 fiber actually hypertrophied a little bit. And that, for some people, are like, hey, that doesn't make sense. Well, while this isn't fiber typing uh, for the, the lecture, I still think that it would be really important for everybody to understand that, hey, this type 1, type 2 dichotomy that we always, that, that I was taught uh, occurred. It isn't like that. Uh, it's actually characteristics. And you can have, you know, the uh, characteristics of a, a type two fiber on a type one, and especially during the conversion. So we see this increase in type one, it might become more of a what would be called a one C, which is an intermediary fiber that hey, we're seeing some conversion here. man. Uh, so that's that's kind of cool. So we're probably seeing that those myosins got a little bit thicker. Uh, in those type 1 fibers as they start to transition towards type 2 with the continued training, which would then decrease their diameter size after, you know, you know 
eventually get it up to the regular type 2, and then the type 1 fibers would probably all be about 50.7 again. See that, uh, that difference. Uh, why? After they transition to the type 2, so after this, you know, decreases even more. Uh, then we look at the fiber percentage area type, and we see we went from 43 to 34. Now, what is the difference here? What is percentage area? Uh, well, we know that the type 2 numbers, uh, they're, they're also bigger. They're significantly bigger than the type 1. So even if the numbers aren't going to match up, right? It's because if we have the same, uh, let's say we had the same percentage of type 1 and type 2. Let's say it was 50% and 50% but then our diameter was bigger for the type two, then our area would be bigger for type two. So we go from 43 to 34 and 57 to 65%. So we see roughly the same change in the area that we saw in the, the number. And that's not unexpected. Uh, so one of the cool things about this is that uh, there's some people who think that you've got to do the long, slow distance, you know, uh, to build the aerobic base, you know, we get it need to go out and uh, run laps around the track. Well, no, you, you, you don't. If you're wanting to see an improvement of VO2 max, which we saw here, uh, it wasn't tremendous, but it's a pretty good chunk. And you don't want to tax and cause the person to get slower because they got faster with this type of workout. You can absolutely do sprinting Sorry for the uh, Blair Witch Project looking thing as I, I flip through there. We can see that these were all sprints. They were just done with incomplete recovery. So then that means that, hey, this incomplete recovery drove the lactic and it drove the glycolytic. It drove some aerobic adaptations and it was all done with sprinting. So you can get faster, get in better shape become more resistant to the uh, hydrogen ions, improve your buffering capacity, all from just sprinting and going fast. And, you know, I'm kind of like Ricky Bobby on this, baby. I want to go fast. So, you, you know, the, uh, the body becomes its function. If you continually train fast, you are going to see more improvements in those type 1 fibers. And we'll probably see even improvements in the calcium channels that are used uh, for contraction, going to more of the faster rather than the slower that are good for force or endurance. Uh, we'll see more improvements in the faster ones that are for sprinting. So the bottom line here is uh, sprint good, uh, slow distance bad, whenever we're dealing with explosive type sports. We can absolutely do the conditioning and get the results that we want with sprinting. We don't have to go out and just run continuous miles uh, to build that aerobic base. We can do it this way with uh, just simply altering, uh, altering excuse me, the work recovery uh, duty cycle. All right, guys. Uh, if you want more information like that, hey, just come see me at the U. Uh, we've got some master's program. We've got a bachelor's program. And if you've already done both of those, I've even got some coaches education courses up that, uh, that, that are going to be through, the, uh, through uh, our uh, continuing education. Or, uh, uh, so it'll be uh, some great stuff there. And, uh, yeah, would love to see you. I'll catch you later.